And just another reminder for folks who haven't yet signed the Blue Sheets QR, there are only 50 people showing in the room, but I count more than 50 here. So somebody hasn't. So please make sure you sign in. Ian, I also changed the name so that it, Ian's last name would not be on <laughs> My last should always be <laughs> Yeah. Can you get this email I sent with the captions? Yes. We've had a discussion with the uh, ISB on the interim planning thing and resolutions look to be arriving there to coordinate with the last few months and potential posts. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. You want the notes just as one document? Uh, uh, the same document is fine. Just put a, a note at the start of the date. You want to go? Howdy, folks. Welcome to the Media Over Quick Working Group. Uh, if you were not expecting that, we would appreciate you scanning in the blue sheet before you leave, because obviously we want a bigger room next time. This is a little tight. Um, for everybody else, please do remember to scan in the blue sheet so that we do get rooms big enough for the group uh, without hopefully giant posts in the middle that prevent us from seeing half of you. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, to everybody for remembering to do that. Um, here is the note well, uh, since we showed it to you at the beginning, this is really for the information of anybody who wasn't joining us earlier in the week. Uh, we'd also like to remind you that the ITF does have a code of conduct and we do expect you to follow the code of conduct at these meetings, uh, which means uh, being very careful to uh, value the opinions of, of your colleagues and to treat them with respect. Uh, here are the meeting tips. These again have not changed since uh, our first meeting. Uh, and they reference how to use the Meet Echo um, clients. Uh, here are session uh, details. The, the note taker is Mo Zanetti, who has selected a lovely chocolate. If you would like to be backup note taker and select another chocolate, you can uh, rush up and uh, claim that now. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, thank Mo and uh, appreciate his service. Uh, we've already done this agenda, and this is our agenda day two. Uh, we'll have warp issues followed by mock transport uh, issues follow up. Uh, obviously, we didn't notice that it was Ian Sweat, not Ann Sweat. So, uh, in, in this case, we will also be uploading a revision to these slides <laughs> so that our embarrassment does not con uh, continue into the, uh, into the long term data tracker thing. Uh, then, mock usages with Suhas. Um, Mo will be giving us a recently renamed web codex container uh, thing. Uh, Ali will be presenting uh, a bit of work on prioritization, and then we'll chat about uh, possibly getting an interim. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Those who are just joining us, please do remember to uh, scan the blue sheets as you come in, because that helps us make sure that we get a, 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 an appropriately sized room. So thanks very much. Um, and next up is Will, unless anybody would like to bash the agenda. Seeing no one bash the agenda, uh, uh, Will, are you going to present uh, from your own thing, or do you want me to just? Okay. Yep. Okay, good afternoon, Will Law Akamai, and welcome to our first section here on issues relating to Warp Draft. So just to set the context a little bit, Warp Draft is the streaming format that's sitting on top 
of mock transport. So it's the layer that knows about audio and video and media and sequence and timestamps and GOPS, whereas the core transport does not. And we have a number of juicy issues to be debating up front that really will set the direction uh, for a lot of development. We're very much at the PowerPoint stage of this uh, protocol. And I was told to remove animation, so there's unfortunately no animation in any of my slides now. Explain the chairs. Next, next step. So we had some sidebar meetings. Uh, right now, we have a monolithic uh, draft for warp. We're going to break that up into smaller pieces, pieces that we think make sense. On the left-hand side, you have what we're defining as some core drafts that don't exist today, but will exist shortly after this conference. The first is a catalog draft. We feel there's enough commonality in catalog behavior that we can create a draft that can be referenced by other streaming formats. Then there's packaging drafts, one relating to CMAP. It tells you how to take CMAP content and package it for distribution over mock transport. Another draft that was called LOCK in the prior meeting is really web codecs. So it's a draft for how to take output of web codecs and package them for transport over mock transport. And then to keep us honest, one for moving text, just as a, as a reminder that mock transport doesn't only have to move audio and video. And then on the right-hand side is how we would use these. So I'm showing three streaming formats here. There is Warp, which itself will be a draft. It has business-specific logic that's the red, the red block. Anything not covered by the drafts that it refers to, which would be the catalog draft, CMAP packaging, and web codecs, because Warp intends to support both those packaging formats. There'll be another draft called Lock, low overhead, or maybe the name will change, I'm not sure, that leaves out the CMAP, particularly for IPR reasons in this case, but there might be other reasons you might not want to include packaging formats. And it, it would, but it would still use the same catalog format and web codex draft. And then Alan's chat might use the text packaging and specific logic, but Alan said he doesn't want to use the catalog and he doesn't have to. It's not a requirement to use it. It's just a convenience uh, to use it. So hopefully that gives some example. These were discussions yesterday. We're just showing this as an output. So it's a chance for anyone to give feedback or we'll say this is an irrational approach to arranging. Okay, we'll go on to questions then. So in the current draft, the catalog, the catalog is the document that describes the tracks that are being produced. It describes the, the media format of the tracks, how to initialize the tracks and how to select them and to subscribe to them. So it's the binding uh, agent. The real question is, do we need a system which advertises formats to blind clients? In other words, does the client say, I want to watch something, tell me all the formats you have the system must send you a list of formats you then choose from them. Or can we reasonably assume that the client will know the format it wants to consume before attempting to subscribe to it or, or to consume the content? And there's this, the answer to this question then uh, affects subsequent questions. No worries. Welcome. Come on in. The, uh, and I would point out with modern media today, it's pretty much the latter, that the client, if you're playing HLS or Dash, you know you're playing it before you go and ask for the M3U8 or the MPD or the RTMP stream or the SRT stream. Any opinions here? Someone present it to you and then... Okay. If I suggest that it's reasonable that clients know the format they want to consume before they join the network, would anyone object to that? Ian will object. I'm not here to object at all. Oh, okay. I actually think that's the most rational approach. Uh, I would, but I do. I am curious, like, what happens if that fails? So, like, is there a fallback path? Because I think what you're saying is exactly correct. The vast majority of the time, the clients know exactly what's going on. Does there need to be a fallback? Or like basically a response like, you know, 500, that didn't work, but like here are things you could subscribe to, or is it just like fail? I don't have a strong yep. opinion. I'm just asking that question. So my answer would be you ask for something that's not there. You get a, the equivalent of a 404. It's not available. It's up to you or your CMS or your application space to say what's your fallback or your, or your failover. Uh, more of a clarification question, Suhas, Cisco. So are we talking about catalog format or the streaming format? Like, it, I think this question has two things, right? Um, 
I think we're using this question was written okay. uh, when catalog was not being used by multiple streaming formats. The intent is probably a streaming format, right? Okay. Because if you're a player that only now knows how to play lock, you don't want to get a warped warp catalog, even though they're the same catalogs, right? You can't play the content. So you want to be able to specifically ask for lock. But the question okay. is, do you know you're asking for lock before you ask for it? Versus do you ask the system to give you a, a menu basically of all yeah. the formats and then you pick one? I, I think going with uh, the solution where we know what to ask for would, would be the first natural way we build the systems. And if you really need the case where I want to, I'm building a client that's aggregator of multiple things and I would want to know what can I support, uh, having gatewaying into different yeah. things, we can add that functionality. Okay. Thanks. Luke here. Um, this is similar, not exactly the same thing, but I would like uh, a URL or some way you can just say, hey, VLC, here's blah, 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 dot mock. So it knows that this is mock. It initializes the decoder. It doesn't have to just, you don't have to specify as a drop down or something. And it, so it's similar. It's like there should be a way to identify the format. Um, but it's, this is loaded, so, yeah. To be clear, you want to identify the format based on the URL that's, or a connect string that's used to connect, right? Because you might not have a URL if it's real quick. I have to find it for multiple. Ali? And this is Ali. Uh, I agree with uh, what Luke is saying, but then I have another use case where the client doesn't necessarily know uh, which uh, one of the, I mean, which one of these formats actually is going to offer maybe a better experience. So Locke might have in a, standard definition resolution, whereas CMAP might have something else, higher or better, multi-channel audio, all kinds of stuff. So maybe, you know, the client, uh, instead of asking for each of these options separately, maybe there should be an option to get what's really available as the service so that then the client decides, okay, I want to pick this one. Okay. And we actually have an example of that coming up in the next slide. So, so it's just like when you go to a restaurant, you, I mean, maybe you want to eat fish, but you don't just ask for the fish menu. I mean, you get the whole menu and then look at maybe other things as well. Spencer, Spencer Dawkins, I, I, um, I will say this and sit down, but um, it seemed like to me that where we are now, um, it's starting to be useful for us to look more seriously at, for instance, the architecture draft um, and uh, try to talk about architectural questions at an architectural level. Um, and uh, don't let me derail anything you're doing for the next six months, but uh, just kind of reminding the chairs that we have that uh, on our deliverables thing. So um, that, that, would be, that would be a good thing for us to talk about offline probably. Thank you. Okay. Colin Jenks. Uh, um, I'm totally happy with this or various versions of it. And at first I was going to get up to say, well, like I'm fine on the format being there, but maybe you'd want the version still in the document. And then I'm like, wow, this is nuts. Why am I commenting on any of this? It's all fine. Um, but I do feel like, y y you know, we still need to figure out like what's what part of the walls is going to ha hold the roof up. And this seems more like, you know, where the doorknob is going to fit. But um, we will need to figure this out for sure. And like, it, it, like any of these would work. I think, I think, yeah. I think it, to me, it's more like, do we need doors or not? Like that type of decision because, yeah. yeah. But I think the next slide makes it clearer. Hi, hello, this John. This is a question of how many options you have. If there are only two, then it's reasonable to say that, okay, if one didn't work, take the other. If there are 227, that's not an option. The, client needs help to figure out what the other possible supported options are when its main options didn't work. And if it's 227, then it's also a fingerprinting thing that the client is revealing something about themselves that they might not want to have revealed. So plenty of trouble. Thank you. Uh, so I ended myself to, you to just ask whether this would work as a solution. Um, can we add a layer of indirection here? So if the client does know what it's asking for, it asks for the, the media directly. And if it doesn't know, it asks for a different media type that is in, a, in essence a list. And that would al allow you to treat uh, the list as a media 
event that, that's requested in exactly the same way and just kicked off other media events potentially. And if you do that, it seems like you kind of don't have to decide now as Suas was suggesting, you can kind of see as you go whether you need this list thing and what it needs to have in it as we get some implementation experience, et cetera. So that would be a catalog of catalogs? Yeah. Okay, so it's great if, if we can go to the next issue, we actually have an example of that. Um, so I, I, on that one, I think there was some consensus that clients have an idea of what they want to consume. So here's the question. Assuming we have multiple catalogs now, or oh, sorry, multiple streaming formats, uh, how can a client ask for a specific one? So there's four parallel solutions squashed onto the same page so you can compare them all. On the left, we've given the catalogs unique names. So you either call it catalog warp, catalog Allen chat, or you just call it warp. These would be strings that are in, a, in an IANA registered table, so we avoid collisions. Or we could go with numbers if we want numbers. So that's solution number one, is that you give explicit names for these things. Um, solution two is catalog of catalogs, as was just mentioned. So you ask for this top level thing that's always called catalog. And in it, it can then say, I've got a type zero. And again, that's an IANA registered type of streaming format. And here's the track name that will get you the catalog or the entry point to that. And you could then choose. And that presumably would collapse down to a standard catalog if there was not multiple formats available. Solution three is, again, a single catalog, but it always lists all the tracks available on all the catalogs that it's producing. So it's a one-stop shop. If you're producing things across multiple flavors, you put them all in the one document. So you don't, it, there's not another round trip to request another catalog. An example four is we defer knowledge of the format to the CMS or the application. And in this case, everything's called catalog, but the path here is dictating the format. And it's actually reasonable. We can build solutions that work. And this is much like HTTP requests work today for content. So of these four solutions, what are the preferences? Uh, so has this go, since, since the, cat, the catalog cannot stand on its own, right? It's part of a streaming format. So if, if I'm, I'm a client who's supporting a watch streaming format or a log streaming format, I want to get the bundle as part of the streaming format. So option four is the closest one where you say, I'm interested in the warp a streaming format, get me the catalog for that one. Or I'm building like, I, I'm, inter I'm interested in using Alan's chat uh, streaming format, I'll ask for the catalog for that one. I think going with option forward is like more restful way of uh, naming the things and that should be so my preferred it, option. To be clear, option four is all the catalogs are named the same and we require the application yes. space to figure out some path difference. Right, I would say like it's a streaming format slash catalog. Yes. So you like, want to mandate that? Yes, or? because you, you are a client that go trying to support a watch streaming format, then I would not need a catalog as part of the streaming format. I don't think so. We have a use case where we have a standalone catalog, which has nothing to do with the streaming format. It's always part of some streaming format, the first boxes that you showed. So scoping it as part of the streaming format is more natural that way. Thanks. Hi, Phil Baker. Yeah, uh, this reminds me of uh, when we face this with HTTP. I think we've tried all four of these and we found all of them didn't work. <laughs> uh, I think I would go for two, and here's why. Yes, you might end up with 200 streaming formats, but you're going to try and avoid that outcome. If you end up with 200, yeah. you've already lost. So you're going to want to try and guide people into a small number of formats. And if you, 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 if you can get that catalog so that it is the recipient can get what they need in one or two packets in a single round trip, that's a win. If you end up having more packets, well, the sender's got to start making decisions and they're going to be thinking about how to optimize it. So two, where you've got the hierarchical thing where I can put the things that I think are going to work 
And then for the things where you're doing weird stuff, yeah, here's a link. You can follow that for more. I think that that covers everything without boxing you, without boxing you into one particular solution and you can't get out of it, and without having a silly overhead that you for extensibility that you don't need. Okay. Luke here. Uh, so I really like Ted's suggestion um, where we basically do option two if you have no idea what's going on. It's a tuple. From last meeting, everybody loves tuples. Tuples of Where you have a format and you have an opaque blob as the, the name of the track. If you already know the format, like you negotiated out a band then, and you know it's warped, then that blob is what you request. So yeah, I think two lets you support both. If you don't know anything, you, you get that catalog. It tells you all the possible formats. If you already know a name and you know it's type, just request it. You don't need to request that uh, to it all. So a uh, clarifying question. If the catalog is then a deterministic name, you can always ask for a catalog. It's a reserved string, and anything publishing content must make something available at slash catalog. Is that what you, is that? No, because if not, then how do you know to... Uh, how do you know to ask for that thing in the first place? And why couldn't you have simply asked for the thing you really want? Well, so if you already know what the thing you really want is, if you already know that this, this URL, like think of it HTTP. Like if but, you're making an HTTP request and you already know that it is an M3 wait, even without the extension, you just treat it like an M3 wait. If you don't know what it is, you need some descriptor that tells you this is an HLS playlist. Our answer to our first question was there was some consensus that clients know what they want to consume. So if a client knows what it, that it wants to consume a chat or a certain catalog, then do we, do we really need this introspection step where there's some other solution that lists all the catalogs and it does it all the time? I, again, I think this comes down to the previous discussion. Do you support clients that don't know what they want? And if the answer is maybe, then you have to support both. Or yes, you know. Okay. Victor. Uh, Victor, Google. Uh, I don't think uh, those are entirely mutually exclusive. Uh, okay, let me explain. So first of all, we always have to kind of support three or some version of three. That is to say your catalog may have entries that you are interested in, and it also may have entries for some codecs that you don't understand and stuff that you don't need, so you'd have to skip it. Uh, now, as People have pointed out that two and the four are kind of complementary in the sense that if you can do two, you can also do four if you know in advance the exact path. So I think that is the right way forward. And I guess the, the big question is like, what do we mean by warp slash catalog and HS slash catalog? Because uh, in most cases, like warp is a format, but it's also you would usually pick some format based on your use case. Specifically, if you have a, are doing live streaming and you're trying to watch arbitrary live streams, that would be one endpoint. Versus if you try to publish something or do video conferencing, that would be a different name. So the name here, it does, it's not necessarily tied to what you're expecting, but might be more tied to what you telling the server what you're trying to do. Uh, Ian Sweat, I, I think there are three different possible situations. And it's clear that we want to support uh, clients that just know exactly what they want. Like, that's very straightforward. Um, I think I, as an individual, would probably want to support like an ALPN sort of situation where I'm like, I have a preference list, and I'm like, I can do use this type or this type or this type, but like, give me whichever one like works the best for me. Uh, I'm not sure if that's actually a requirement, but like, it seems plausible. Um, maybe that's too complicated. Um, and so I guess we have to decide as a working group, like, do we care about the case when like the client doesn't have full information or not? And it seems like it, at this point where we're at, it would be easier to support it, which would I think favor something in the shape of two. Um, and then as Ted said, we can always drop it later if it turns out to be totally useless. Um, 
but those are my thoughts. So I think it, this is very much a question of like, what are working group requirements? Like what, you know, and, and I think that will hopefully direct us in the right direction. Uh, Colin, uh, just about everything I've heard of the mic makes a lot of sense to me. I'll say I'm not really, the thing I don't like about three, one downside I see of three for sure, is I think often when I think about like, you know, you know, lock and, and warp or something, these could be generated by completely different systems that inside of a given provider or, or service provider platform or impossible different platforms. So I think that stuffing the catalogs into the same thing, that seems like a disadvantage of me. I sort of prefer these ones where it's either a meta pointer to the other catalogs or uh, the catalogs are in, in some way separated for the, the two different formats or however many different formats it is. So, um, you know, I, I, let, me, let me put a slight, a slight vote in for not three. Spencer Dawkins, um, and I'm glad that I got in line behind uh, Cullen. I agree with his observation. Uh, I did have one question. Um, you, you actually called out uh, registration in IANA for option one, but not the other ones. It, was that intentional? No, that's inferred. So anytime you see type zero, type three in the other examples, those would be IANA registered. Oh, okay, okay, codes. okay. Thank you. Yeah. That, 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 was, that, was, that was what I hoped the answer yeah, was. Thank you. The, the, the question is, we're going to register them. Do we register a number or do you register a string name? Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, can I insert myself in the queue? Uh, so actually, oh, we're sorry. going to do Victor, who's next, and then we're going to do a show of hands tool. Those of you who remember humming, you may also hum to yourselves while we do that. But first, Victor. Yeah, I, I think a kind of a small counterpoint to what Colin just said is perhaps the fact that they can generate it by different entities means that not just we have to add linking, but we have to have some well-defined story for how to merge catalogs. Uh, because, like, at some point you would have like a small catalog from one live, from one media conferencing participant, and you would want to figure out how to merge them. Okay. Uh, after makes sense. I meant more that we'd have a version that would like. Let's say there was a broadcast, and there was you know one subsystem that encoded it as. HLS dash and distributed it out that way and another way that was going to do something that might be like that type of different systems. But your point that like we want to be able to think about how these merge seems valid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, on the point of merging them, we've already shown examples where catalogs are either JSON or binary. You, you can't merge those two things. They're different. They, they have to be listed as different objects. I, I just want to insert my own preference, which given that we've had preference for four and two and not three, I actually prefer one. Uh, but here's why. I think the use case where we clients are having a confusion about the formats, or in fact, you have a distribution system that's multi-format, are going to be very rare. They're going to be so rare that I don't even want to make it the primary design case. I think the vast majority of the time, the client just wants to ask for something, and it wants it explicitly. And that's why I would give them clear names, like warp and HF. And any time I ask for warp, I know what I'm getting. If I'm debugging the network and I see a request for warp, I know what it is. I don't see this opaque container and I have to go in it. So I like the determinism that comes from just a registered name for the format and I get that catalog. And if, you're if you have a client that doesn't know what to ask for, you have another out of band system to give it a menu or a list, listing them, and then it can go ask for them explicitly. That's my pitch for number one. Okay, uh, so in order to uh, to judge this, what I think is actually going on here is we're still kind of going around the question of the blind client. And I think you just put it as you believe that uh, the blind client is going to be vanishingly rare, that, yes. that it's going to know what it wants. Um, and I think, uh, therefore, we're going to start a, uh, a start a show of hands tool. Uh, those of you who remember humming, you may hum along during this. And the, the, the raise your hand was... This use case, the blind client use case, should be supported. Do not raise hand if you believe it should not be supported, at least for now. We can always add it later, but uh, that's the show of uh, hands tool here. Uh, please uh, fire up your clients and get ready to answer the question. So, there, 
Sure, raise hands means I, I support the blind client use case and it should be part of the design space now. The blind client is the one who doesn't know what it's asking for. That's what he called it in the first slide. Yeah. You, you didn't understand the question. You want everybody else to start over? Okay. Um, I, if you just want to raise your hand, if you did the wrong thing, I'll count you separately. Okay, one, two. Oh, so, so two people actually raised their hand for the wrong thing. Okay. Okay, there are 90 something people and 32 of you expressed an opinion. I'm gonna say going once, going twice. One more person expressed an opinion, thank you. Okay, we're gonna close this out. This does not look like a strong consensus one way or the other. I would say uh, there is a mild uh, preference for supporting it. So I would say we don't want to make any design decisions that rule it out. Um, so but we'll if, come up with reasonable solutions for both of these and then explore them further. Then explore them further. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, we got eight minutes, 40 seconds left and I got six more issues. Here. <laughs> Are we going to have a vote on the, this one that's on the slide right now? So for where we, you mean between, yeah, the blind clients. Oh, sorry. It's changed. Uh, the, the prior issue, I, I'm not clear on what our position is. We had votes of support for four, two, one, and a general consensus, not three, but. Uh, so I think we did have a general consensus to three. The decision between the others depends, I think, on the blind client one. So you're not to rule out the uh, unknowing client at this point in the design phase, okay, was... but we're not otherwise making a decision. So at this okay. point, you can put a proposal in and we'll discuss it in the context of the specific proposal. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, moving on to next issue. Uh, this was a question, and this is actually preceded by events, but it is an issue, so I wanted to raise it here. I think it's that we have a very clean answer already. Should the catalog be a separate draft and not part of the stream format? I showed you a picture where it's a separate draft. We're given arguments for why it should be a separate draft. I think it should be a separate draft, um, but I'm open to opinions at this point as to, to whether it shouldn't be for some reason. If we feel, if the reason it shouldn't be is that there's enough commonality in what catalogs have to do that we can write one catalog that rules them all for all future use cases and we just do that right now. That would be a reason uh, not to have it as a separate. Luke? Uh, I'm just gonna say, keep them separate. I think every live streaming protocol has them separate. Like the HLS playlist is completely separate from the container. Um, in theory, even RTP is the same. SDP and RTP, they could be used interchangeably. Uh, so keep them as two separate layers, the catalog layer and the container layer. Victor. Um, yeah, I, I think the catalog <laughs> should be a separate thing because this means that we can do once solve all of the both simple issues for catalog and possibly more complex issues like encryption uh, at like the layer where you specify it as like the thing between catalog and uh, the specific containers that you're using. Okay. okay. Any other thoughts on this? No, I think fair consensus there. Okay, next issue, please. SVC. So current draft said tracks must be independently decodable uh, because it's supporting CMAP and that's CMAP. Uh, and SVC is not supported. So should we add SVC su support to warp or should we create a separate streaming format that only supports SVC? And the third one we've actually agreed to do, which is merge lower overkin container and SVC. So that's passed by events since these slides were written. But I do think it is, SVC is very, we, we always add academic arguments for SVC. I just don't see it used in production. And I would rather make a format that adds what is used versus, and then create a separate format for SVC later when there's a real production use case at the table. Uh, 
Suhas? Like, uh, should we, uh, Suhas, so Cisco, should we add SVC to warp or not? It's kind of a parallel question is that like the catalog format today, if you think about lock, it supports SVC, but it's an optional extension. If only if, uh, if the streaming format, format wants to use it, it has to define that one. So I agree if, if SVC is something on, on one of those things, we don't know if we want to use in recent uh, time. So it's more like, I would say, not until you have a real requirement for that. Okay, so to be clear, you're suggesting leave it out until we have a real requirement. Don't put a placeholder in. Because when you put yeah. a placeholder in and we write test suites, we've got to test them right. for anything so, that's in there. Right, I was like the catalog defines it. Yeah. Uh, and it's an optional, so it's not mandatory even in catalog. And if a streaming format needs it, they have a use case, then you go and add at that point in time. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to get in the tool, but I'll ignore that. Um, I mean, I, I, like, I understand SVC is not used widely in the streaming world, but in the real-time world, Microsoft has a limited use of it in pretty extensive production at this point. Um, so there are some, some uses of it in, in places uh, or, or variants of, of an SVC-like thing. Um, I, I don't, I've never stood very strong on the tracks must be independently decodable. I mean, obviously, the audio and the video have to go together at some level, yet they're different tracks, right? And I've always just thought we should, you know, decodable is a vague term here, right? And so the different layers of a layered codec could possibly be in different tracks or the different tracks. I don't think we have to worry about that. And I certainly am not arguing that we should put SVC into warp for, at all, because I, th in the warp context, I think you're clear that it's, it's not used and let's not add it until somebody has a use case and need for it. Um, but I don't think would that, that I, I would, I'm fine with that, but I think that's a little bit different from saying we're going to be like 100 dependent on independently decodable tracks have to always be the way. That's all I'm pushing back on, the, if that makes sense. Is that fair? As a clarifying answer, the, the, the question here is within, within the syntax for the catalog, we have a relationship uh, key value pair. Right. And the relationship is time aligned, but should there be a relationship which is this track is dependent on other tracks. Like you, you, need, yeah. you can't pull this by itself. You must always pull it with something else. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that we are going to need that somewhere. It could be an, ex I think we have to allow that extension if nothing else. I think that we are going to get to describing relationships between tracks, including this audio ought to be synced with this video being the simplest version of that. You know, I think that we need to uh, allow for those types of relationships and those will, will end up on some of the ones that end up in scalable or simulcast codecs, which are widely used. Um, but I don't think that that should complicate it. I don't care if it's in the base comp base version of the draft, uh, you know, it could be an extension, whatever, like this is, shouldn't be a big deal. So is that a fair, do you agree with that or think it's something different? Yeah. yeah I'm okay. willing to put a placeholder, but not do a, a ton of work right now. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, Allow just like for acknowledge this might happen in the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna say we've only got a couple of minutes yeah. left in oh. this presentation. Fairly long queue. I locked it, but try to be brief. Uh, uh, Victor, uh, so, so uh, one thing I wanted to point out is ignoring SVC. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to like always record for tracks to be decodable because depending on what your format is, decodable this might not even make sense. Uh, of whether we can allow one track depend to another, that's the problem of the container format. That is specifically like if you have containers, it tells you that this is like an overlay on this track, the container has to deal with that. And if you're able to parse that container, you will be able to parse that dependency. But I don't even think the catalog needs to know about that because this is not something you will care about until you reach decoding or like for formats that you don't understand, you don't need that information. Okay, Ali? I will say uh, no need for SVC support in warp, but if there is a need for SVC support in a uh, lock, uh, so be it. Um, I think MP4 supports SVC in theory, like what Victor said, the container just delegates and there's just this relationship that these two tracks depend on each other. Um, question is, should the catalog tell you that or should it be up to the container? Uh, and I think we also need to decide if layers are within a track or if layers are represented as tracks, I think is the bigger question here. Because if layers are tracks, then they must be related to each other somehow. Um, but an extension is also a good idea. I think that might be the right answer. Harold? I'll allow this term. I think you can safely ignore this. 
because you can't avoid SVC because all modern codecs define it within the codec. The idea of transmitting layers as different tra tracks is not something you really need to care about. So just let the codec handle it. Christian? Christian, we're not seeing or hearing you yet. Okay, there you are. Oh, well, we can see you, but not hear you. Mm. Please, do you hear no, me no, now? Okay. Yes, we can. can you hear yeah, yes, yeah, something, something close the, the, the mic. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with Harald. From a transport point of view, it makes a lot of sense to parse the output of the codec and to put the uh, various layers in different tracks because that's the only way you can manage as well. Also, wise, you get a different kind of worm in which you have to have a track managed as a set of, uh, of layers, and then you make the, the, the relay cognizant about this. And, and I would rather not have the relay cognizant about these things. And if you don't want to make the relay cognizant about the structure of your uh, tracks in multiple layers, then it's much cleaner to have each layer in a separate track. So I, I think we have to have, maybe, I mean, I understand it's easier to do with an extension, but we should definitely not do it out. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, Mo? I think um, the, the, the comments that, uh, just leave this to the streaming format. Uh, CMAF does define uh, how SVC should be uh, signaled uh, in, in CMAF. There is a profile for HEVC and VVC uh, SVC um, uh, objects in, in CMAF, but it also mentions about how there are impacts to the manifest because of this. So I haven't looked at a, a Dash or HLS manifest to see how they signal any kind of SVC because let me like I says they don't do it. It's just theoretical. <laughs> uh, um, so, but but from a high level, I would think that the whole purpose of the manifest is to know, you know, how how to consume the resource and how to map it to your decoders. And you can't get to the point of parsing the first thing to know. Oh, I need another decoder, or oh, I need this other track into this decoder. So I think there must be something at the manifest level that says these three tracks have to go to the same decoder because you can't send different layers to different decoders. It all has to be in order and there has to be some, you know, sequence numbering continuity between them. So there must be some, something that specifies the exact order if there's multi-track uh, SVC happening. It, um, whether anyone wants to consume that, that uh, complexity uh, is maybe questionable for the narrow use cases that it, that it solves, but I don't see any way that it could not be in the manifest or, or the catalog uh, and have a, a client work. Uh, okay, so that during the queue and you're sort of out of time. You mentioned a bunch more issues. Uh, are you okay just surfacing those on the list? Or? Can I just show them at least? Yeah, why don't you, why don't you just uh, run through them quick to raise visibility yeah, and then okay, we'll- let's just go quickly. What, what are some of the high level ones? Uh, does, actually, this we have an answer for. Does catalog need to be CMAS specific? Again, these issues were written over the last three months, and we've had consensus in the last few days that, no, we're going to support more than CMAS. So I think the answer clearly here is, no, we'll, we'll have other formats, other containerization, and we'll have drafts for those in case you want to reuse them amongst different streaming formats. So content protection and encryption, two levels of this. One is within the format, you can support DRM. Uh, we're not going to mandate DRM or even describe it here at, at IETF, but it is described by CMAP and common encryption, which CMAP inherits. There are multiple modes within that. To one of the biggest problems with OTT content is diversity in those modes, counter versus CBCS. And we have a chance, since our format's brand new, to stop that and just mandate one of those modes. So there's an option to do that. 
the second option is, oh, sorry, and the second one is, do we define our own content protection? This is some type of envelope encryption, just to encrypt, encrypt the whole object and come up with a schema. And it would be there for people to use. If you want to roll your own, you can go roll your own, but at least you would have an interoperable one that, that would be available. Those were two questions about protection and encryption. Next issue. And then, if there's time, uh, <laughs> should we describe quality parameters for CMAT track instead of the units? We've had some agreement, yes, because it provides a consistent mechanism for discovery or for selecting track segments. Listing all the inits in the CMAP with base 64 for a JSON container gets, gets verbose. So the idea is the inits can actually be tracks of their own and you subscribe to the init track and you get the track. It's a cacheable track, so the edge should have it. Um, I think it's a good idea and we'll look at that. And then thirdly, are we comfortable with a JSON catalog for now? Because it's very easy to describe, to show, for people to read and to debug. And then we can look at a, a more compact binary schema later in the development process. Those were the issues, but I think we need a, uh, either the interim or online as a means to answer them. Yeah, I think um, if there's information here, I mean, it sounds like some of the inf some of the issues are will have been overtaken by events. So uh, I would suggest take the uh, issues that you're looking for feedback on in order to make progress, send them onto the list and say what do people think, see if we can get some yep. asynchronous okay. discussion going, and if not, we'll follow up at an interim. <laughs> it's okay. Um, let me, we can just pause here for a moment and I can talk there for a bit. Um, so there, first there are some minor organizational updates. Um, I created a naming tag as I discussed last time. Um, everyone just does decided that the name of the naming tag was not the right name, um, which I cannot even begin to say how ironic is. And so it is now <laughs> called terminology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think that's a great introduction to this working group. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I added an implementation blocker tag um, for issues that need to be fixed before you can plausibly actually like, implement the spec. Um, this is partially because as an individual, I think it's important to like surface these like fairly early. Like uh, we can discuss a lot of various points, but if you can't like implement the draft and have two people interoperate and it's like not even plausible, then like I think we should spend some time on those issues to try to get it to the point where like people can like write code. Um, that's probably kind of a personal opinion. Other folks can disagree, but um, and then these discussion is basically for stuff it needs to be discussed here or in an interim. Um, just to try to make sure like we get through the most important stuff um, and try to like allow for, for cues like that. Uh, two slides forward. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a, a straw man put forward, but based on discussions with others, um, the idea was to use the mailing list and GitHub where are places where design decisions and discussions can be made. Um, PRs that fix design issues will remain open for at least a week, at least for now, is the intent. Um, plus they will require some approvals and that's to give the entire working group time to comment, review, and so on and so forth. Um, a week is not a long period of time, but it is enough that like those who are interested in an issue should be able to, to get around to it. And obviously now these decisions are permanent um, and you know we'll review them uh, at the next you know, interim. Uh, so large design changes will definitely be publicized on the list. Um, and so you know I, I think um, we'll try to get that balance right so it's not too much information, but uh, certainly I think we think the entire working group really is gonna wanna take a look at, we'll put on the list. Um, and I'll, I'll cut a draft before each interim or plenary. Um, just, you know, so we have a new version and I'll upgrade or summarize the changes uh, at those events. Um, this is my storm round proposal. Do the chairs or the working group have suggestions or thoughts or changes they'd like to make to this? Uh, obviously nothing is set in stone. We can start with this and go forward or not. Not seeing anybody else in the queue, uh, this looks reasonable to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did we lock it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you didn't have to fix it. 
Science Center. Who were originally scheduled? You have that special. Spencer Dawkins, who will not send the note to the the uh, ping to the chairs asking if, if it was closed intentionally. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say about the uh, open for at least a week before merging. Uh, this is now a working group where uh, the GitHub uh, repos are, sum are being summarized uh, weekly, and that's reflected in the mailing list, which makes uh, the weekly thing a lot more palatable for I think I think for anybody, uh, but certainly for certainly for me. Um, I haven't looked to see if all the uh, drafts that are being added to the mock organization, uh, the mock uh, part of the ITF organization, uh, are in the uh, in the. Uh, activity summary uh, yet, but uh, that's, you know, that's something I've talked about with the chairs before, and we can make that happen. That, that, that's a good point. Um, the, one week was kind of my suggestion because um, the intent is to have editor plus, plus author meetings every week. And so the hope would be you get to the point you have a PR that peers and the authors are reasonably happy with, and then you don't let it sit too long because I've seen the other, yeah, yeah, but um, uh, maybe we can get it so those come out in a time frame, probably like Monday-ish, and then the summary emails get sent like Tuesday, or like maybe we can get the time, synchronize them, so to give people the maximum amount of time and visibility. I don't know if that's possible, but like that's something we could look at. The Sunday summary, there's a keyword in there that says Sunday. Oh, okay. So, so it could be Thursday. Okay, so maybe we can just try to time those so like we give people the maximum amount of time, but I think that's a really good comment. So. Um, oh, um, I don't think I have a ton more time, but I do have some issues that are uh, tagged as needs discussion, and I guess I will present. Am I doing the right thing? Uh, uh, did I? I think I granted you. I think you, did you want to share your screen? I did. I don't think it. Asked about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it asked whether you wanted to share preloaded slides. So it's you have the to third out. icon in the top bar. Like there's the hand, and then the, oh, you're on the left. Or... <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> one moment. You can get it to open. That's okay. There we go. Let's see, and I was just going to ask everyone to hum if they missed humming. <laughs> Let the notes show that people hummed. <laughs> Start with the oldest first or the newest first? Newest. New, newest first. There you go. Trust me, you don't want to read the oldest. <laughs> no, no, these are all the ones that like were tagged um, as such. So, Alan opened this issue uh, only two hours ago. Uh, yeah, do you want me to walk through it? That would be wonderful, Alan. Uh, okay. So, uh, as I was, so I've tried to write this mock chat protocol, which uses the pub sub mechanisms in mock transport to tr move text around. Uh, and as I was thinking about it, I've got a, I've got a, a you know, chat clients. There's a single chat server that produces a catalog, um, and it wants to use announce messages from clients to authorize them, and then when they join, then add their tracks to the catalog it is publishing. Um, however, if there's a relay involved, and one of the clients announces to the relay, like, I want to join, the relay has no idea where the server is connected. So another way to put it is that the announce message tells you where you can route a subscribe but nothing tells you a relay where it can route announces that to someone who might be interested or capable of authorizing. 
So uh, I, I think some of this had been vaguely discussed before. And I, my recollection is that there are people sort of like the idea that, oh, this is just business logic. It will be determined by prearranged agreements and relays will, you know, you'll have a contract that says like this relay will route these kinds of things to this origin. So that's one option. Um, another option that at least for the chat protocol, I would like is uh, it would, there was just a message where the server can say, I, if you get an announce for something that looks like this, send it to me and I will accept it or reject it. Uh, and then I was just discussing with Luke who's implemented a relay and he said, oh, the way I handled that was uh, when I get an announce, I send it to everyone who's connected. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that's the issue. And there's Q, Victor. Wonderful. Uh, well, all of those, I mean, option one is kind of like the, the the only correct answer in the sense that like the receiver can do whatever they want with the announce to some extent. Uh, and they, there are, or I see roughly like three ways announce can play out. One is like w with the server you're connecting to is like an ingestion server that will transcode that video. So the server just immediately consumes it. That's one kind of server. The second kind of server is uh, the one that works like HTTP proxy, so it will just proxy that announce to some downstream. Uh, and the third one is like any SFU kind of that does just forward to announce. So if you're building a chat network, in the simplest case, you could like have one server that just makes us all chat messages, or maybe you have a message a server that like you have 10 mixing servers and then you would forward the chat message based on the hash of like the name of your channel. Uh, that's, yeah. They want to make it, make it bigger on the screen. OK, I will also point out that there are already multiple people in the queue. And at this rate, we'll get through exactly one uh, one issue. And if if that, if that. OK, uh, so the queue is going to go Suhas, Luke, Colin, Will. So don't be too far from the mic when it's your turn. Um, so has Cisco. Um, oh, I, so I think I, I this um, in, in in my implementation at least uh, uh, the thing that uh, authorizes the catalog is outside the mock trans transport protocol. It's not part of the mock transport protocol. Announce is basically pub sub. When when you do announce, that relay basically makes a note that uh, for these tracks, who is my uh, where is my publisher or media producer coming from? And when subscribe comes, it'll be routed to that uh, relay in, 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 in my uh, mesh of relays that I have. So what should it be done? I would say it's, this is a business logic uh, which should be outside of mock transfer protocol. Uh, okay, uh, Luke. So yeah, don't do option three. Um, Cause uh, announce, I, I interpret it as a kind of a discovery protocol. But very quickly, if you gossip announces, it gets bad. For, um, so you don't want to do that. Um, mentally, I'm treating it more like kind of like a push promise in HTTP terminology, where it's like a please send a get for this this URL. Just please please do that. And then it's up to the relay: does it forward that? Please send the subscribe, or does it terminate it, or what does it do with it? Um, so I think it's just a request. It's a please subscribe message is what I'm treating announce as. Uh, okay, Colin. Um, so we were really careful in chartering to try, and people wanted to keep the description of how the relays were implemented and the internal relay, how the relays talk to other relays as, as out of scope for the working group. So I think the right way to think about this for us is to be very clear on what the promise the relays are making as a, as a block, which is, um, it, you know, if somebody sent an announce for a given namespace, that a subscribe matching that namespace would make it to them. Okay, we, we, maybe I got that phrase slightly wrong, but roughly something along those lines. And the question that we should be asking here is, for the way you want to think about doing this or the client you're doing, is there any information that should have been in the announce that was not there that you needed? And that's what we should open a bug in if there's anything that was missing there. And I, I suspect there's probably not for a text client because that's sort of done the text line as well. Um, but I, I think that that's, that's the right way to, to, to think about it. And then, you know, how the relays decided to flood fill or deal with or a centralized database, there's many ways they could deal with figuring out their internal routing information. But one way or another, they have to deal with how to 
figure out how they're going to route information. And I think we want that to be basically out of scope. So just to clarify, I totally agree that everything within the relay, I want to be out of scope. But if I think of the relay as a, a cloud and I have two clients and a server that are all connected to the same cloud, how do the, how do the clients find where the server is? Do I need to, if I say I want to do an interop with Luke's um, server or his relay, do I need to make a business arrangement with him that's like, okay, we're going to set up a chat and your relay is going to point announces that look like this to my server. Or is there a way the protocol can tell, like when I server connects and it's like, hey, I'm starting a chat and people who want to join. Right. Send so I mean, I guess maybe I'm not sure the details on that. I won't go on further this time. But if we, if your client can't connect to his relays for yours and his or whatever, I mean, we failed, right? That's not interop. Obviously, this pro we're, as a working group, we're supposed to deliver that my client can work with somebody else's relays. That's the fundamental interop we need. So if we're not making that, we're failing. So yes. Okay, thanks. Well. Yeah, I'm just backing up the, the business logic approach. There's so many other decisions that have to be part of other structure, like how, how does the relay even go forward with any connection? What does it go forward to? All of that is not part of mock transport. That's part of the implementation of a mock transport compliant network. So I think announce the client should announce the catalogs it is willing to produce. That's what it announces. I am the source of these catalogs. What, what the relay does with that is business logic in the relay. Okay, but that one of the fields it announces is an authorization field, which sometimes the relay will be able to validate and sometimes somebody else is supposed to validate. I'm trying to figure out how the relay knows where to send that information, who's going to validate it. Okay. Like so if I'm building a relay network, I will tell the relay you're allowed to validate it because I want my edge to validate it. I'll give it the tools to do that. Other ones might say, nope, forward it to some centralized authorization. And you're saying agent. that second one is out of band. Like there's no- No, the second one's allowed. We, we can't dictate what the, how the network should behave. All we can say is the announce is a single, we will guarantee a client connects to a relay or some, uh, an endpoint and says, I am, I am announcing, I am the source for these catalogs. That's, that's what it has to do. And if, if necessary, it supplies a token to say, and here's my authorization to be the source for them. We, we should not constrain what is done with that information. So I also, uh, I think it didn't mention this when I read the issue, but the, the, the business logic is always an option, right? There's nothing ever precluding their, my, a particular relay network from being configured to do a certain thing with announce. But the question is, should there also be a, a sort of more pro programmatic way? I know we need to uh, Christian, I have luck for you because we have two minutes left total. And as, as I said, with this number of people, we're getting through maybe one. Christian. I think we have to consider the case of having several relay, networks of relays because all the business logic decision assume that you get the name of the track and then you're sending that track name to somehow the right network of relays. That doesn't cover the case of other things that like you're sending that track name to say a local cache server which is independent of things, which may be something in a small business decision. And in those independent relay scenarios, they will have to figure somehow how to propagate the announce to the right place and know whether to do it or not. And we have to be at least explain how that will work. Um, given the amount of time, probably I shouldn't even dive into another issue, but I will just go back to the list of needs discussion items and, you know, ask that folks take a look through them. And if they have strong opinions, uh, please follow up on them. Uh, Thank you all for your time and yeah. Uh, thanks Ian. Uh, who is next? Is it Suas or it's, uh, or Colin? <laughs> Suhas, your hair is so much longer than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention Suhas's spelling just got much worse. Um, uh, you have to actually stop sharing. So that I um, you bring him up. And Sorry. I'm going to stay on schedule with these because the usage. Usages. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, Suhas Mo and I have been working on sort of the, the mock usage of stuff a little bit, and we're, 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 we're not going to make some, it's going to be a little bit of a meta conversation uh, versus a stand up, but jump on next slide here. So, the, uh, you know, this working group at some level, we need to figure out how media goes into quick. <laughs> and uh, transport doesn't actually do that. Um, it, 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 I'll talk a little bit about what it does in a second, but it provides us a way to move around objects and tracks and groups and these sorts of things, which is great. But we need to figure out uh, how the, the actual media, audio, video that we're talking about lands into those different things. And we need to talk about how those things then land onto quick streams, right? Because there's, there's many, many options on that. And this comes back around to like, well, the, the complicated cases like simulcast and SVC and some, some of those things. So I don't expect to make any forward progress exactly on any of those things in this 10 minutes here, okay? What I wanna just queue up a little bit is the technical decisions that I think that we need to make on some of that and how we might go about doing some of this. So next slide. Um, so when we're doing this, a lot of these things, the reasons why you want to arrange these things differently largely have to do with the latency and the reliability characteristics you're going to get by arranging it differently. And a lot of these are deeply coupled with how you think you're going to prioritize things as well. Now, my assumption is that we will be able to, if nothing else, one of our limitations on priority is for a given stream, we can only set one priority level for it at the sort of quick level. And I, I don't think, I mean, I guess you could, the quick working group could theoretically change that, but I'm working on that assumption right now, okay? Um, and that if we want things to have effectively different priority levels and how they're going, we will probably need them to be in different streams. Um, some other things that sort of come up as, you know, the, 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 the impact on, on loss or latency or something. I mean, obviously if you put, your whole complete, you know, you're doing streaming media and you're gonna put the whole mo movie into one stream like a single TCP connection. I mean, it, it might be sort of good from uh, makes your loss recovery stuff e easy, but it might be bad from a head of line blocking and latency point of view. But it's trade-offs on that. So next slide. The, um, just as a reminder of what all of these things are for a second, uh, we, we're, we're basically arranging things into tracks, often correspond to, uh, a video at a given resolution. A video at a different resolution might be, or a different quality or encoding point might be of a, a different track. The audio might be a different track. Um, if, if we get to the question of what it is in a scalable video codec, it becomes much vaguer. But to Harold's point earlier, uh, at some level, it all needs to go to the same decoder, but at some other level, if you want, the whole reason you were using scalable video was to s transmit those layers at different priorities. And if you couple that with the assumption that they need to be in different quick streams to achieve that, it, you know, it gets a little bit more complicated. So, you know, we have to figure out those types of things. So the things we've agreed on that's in the mock transport draft is that uh, we have objects, uh, that, that the, the media will go in an object, some portion of the media in each, each object. We'll put those into groups. Groups form, low, you know, there's, these are logical join points and things you can catch up and come to. And then a, a whole bunch of groups are arranged into a track and we will have multiple tracks. The catalog will help you find all your tracks. Next slide. So, and we're gonna skip through a bunch of slides. Uh, sure, next slide. I've sort of covered big, big chunks of this. So I'm not going to go through each one of these slides, but you can see in the, in the draft and in these slides, and this type of thing I'd like to slowly fill in and figure out as time goes on here, is we have a bunch of different proposed models and ways of doing this that various people have been brought up at various points in time. And it might not be that we wanna do all of these. We probably wanna do more than a single one of them. But you no, know, one is like one encoded frame per object, right? And so we look at that, we think about what's in that object, we can write some pros and cons of it, sort of figure it out uh, and, and start having some implementation experience on these. Because as you implement these, they often turn out, they work differently than you thought they were gonna work before you implemented them. So let's skip through a bunch of the slides here but you sort of get an idea of the flavor of the different ones that I think that we need to think about over time and help fill in these things. Don't take these pros or cons too seriously. I didn't think about them all that strongly. Like, like, like that's one of the things we need to do is collect the data and figure that out. Keep skipping forward here. Um, <clears throat> more, more, more on the skips, you know. Um, <laughs> so let's stop here for a second. So uh, go back one slide. This is such a speedy system, forward and back. I love it. Uh, so 
the next issue we need to do with is you've got these objects um, and you know you need to describe how they get mapped into quick streams and again this is different based on what you think the priority scheme uh, are and what we're doing for those in the streams. But, you know, things we've heard is a quick stream per object, per group, you know, multiple tracks, uh, various different ideas have been, have been done on this, but we need to experiment and play with those things, see how they all come out and pros and cons. So let's go to the next couple slides. We'll probably skip a few because they mostly relate to looking at those types of things. Yeah, so we'll do pros and cons of these. We'll talk about what they are, how they are. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, SVC, there's a couple different possibilities here. All layers in one track was proposed earlier in this session. Next slide. Um, you know, one track per layer, you know, was proposed. Next slide. I mean, I, you know, which one of those is better? I'm not even going to know. So here's my last slide, actually. And this is the one I want to actually talk about with people. So my actual proposal on this right now is we should not be trying to decide this today or tomorrow. That what we need to do is we need to implement some of these things. And some of them we need to just think hard about. We can implement on a piece of paper. Some of them we need to implement in real code. Maybe it's not a full running perfect system that does the protocol, but it's enough code that it has exhibits characteristics similar to what Mock would do if it did this. And we need to sort of document the results on those. Um, and then at that point, try and pick which one of these really makes sense as the code points for us. So the thing I'm most interested in getting feedback on is like, people agree on that, disagree, what are the things they want to see implemented, what are the ways that they want to characterize and think about the quality of these implementations, what's the data that we'd want to collect before we made really good decisions on this. So with that, um, that's basically my end, and let me just open it up from there to collect in for, you know, whatever input people want to get, and we'll try and make that happen going forward in the draft. Thanks. Bernard, you're first. Yeah, I wanted to uh, back Cullen's suggestion that you can just go implement stuff and figure out what works. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I've implemented SVC with mock and it, it works fine. It doesn't require a lot of complexity. You just need to understand what's discardable and what's not. Um, so it doesn't have to be a huge deal. Uh, okay, thanks. Jonathan Rosenberg. And I, since we only have a minute left and two other presenters, I, I did lock the queue. Oh, right. Jonathan Rosenberg, 5-9. I think there are, is an important difference between the questions you're asking here. The question about how we map mock t objects, groups, and tracks into Quick is something that when we do it, it's locked. It's like, so I think maybe Luke said this idea of separation of church and state, right? One of these things, which is the stuff the Relay Network is doing, once we spec it and deploy it, this is extremely hard to change. And we want to give flexibility at that layer so that the application above can, you know, constantly be mucking around with this and different, different applications can make different decisions. And that's the second issue you're describing, which is how we map, for example, codec frames and slices and whatever into the objects that mock exposes. So I think it's far like the most important property for me is a system that we're in the relay network allows the application to make delayed decisions that we can change in the future about how this mapping works. But, Thank sorry, you. It went, and the, so the, the one that you want to make sure that we have that future, like we carve in stone for future fu extensibility now is the sort of mapping of objects to quick streams, not so much the mapping of media right. objects, right? That's right. Okay. And the yeah. primary property for that one, for how we map mock t to quick, yeah. that has to just give flexibility so that we can use it in however we want at the application layer. Sounds good. Luke's giving you a thumb up, so up and lots of people are nodding, so. Quick question. It, you know, nine months ago in, in Mock, we were talking about streams and datagrams. And I noticed in this presentation, there was, it was all streams and no datagrams. Have we, is there consensus that we can make this work with slices of very small streams? Or is there still interest or in so, experimenting with datagrams? Okay, I'm definitely going to experiment with datagrams no matter what this working group says. Because the general, lots of people, the people who seem pro, we can do this all with streams only think that a single object per stream will be the same as datagrams. So that's the argument that's made, okay? And that may be true, it may not be true. I will point out that Clubhouse's deployment suggested it certainly was not true with quick stacks at the point in time that was deployed. Um, so there is large, but I think we need to experiment with that. Certainly I wanna see datagrams. I have not, I, you know, I just got so much pushback on datagrams. I was like, oh, I'm not even gonna bring that up until I have some data that backs there might be a need for it. But again, it's back, if I can bring a, con then I'm speaking, you know, I, I, 
I, I suspect that streams are uh, streams of the single object are not going to work as well as datagrams for audio. And I'm interested in the audio use case. If I'm wrong about that, awesome. I'll just use streams. If I'm right about that, yeah, you'll be hearing from me and like, you know, you guys can all make fun of me then. <laughs> Alternate. Altanai from Cisco Meraki. I'm, I'm curious what kind of metrics are you using in your decision-making process to evaluate these very many options? Uh, this is a really great question. I was hoping people were going to give me good answers to that. Um, but I, what I would say is that's sort of evolving, um, but certainly latency is really one of the key ones to me. And then also artifacts and artifacts at a sort of um, human user experience, how good you would rate the media quality experience. And that is really hard to, you know, taking, figuring out what a, a human perceptual score is, it would rate a given video quality in an automated way has always been a hard problem um, that's never perfectly answered, but we're trying to sort of figure out how can we just have something that has uh, low latency, not a huge efficiency overhead bandwidth in how much extra bandwidth we use, particularly in an audio only case. And when there are artifacts due to uh, packet losses, and I'm really interested in not random packet losses, but the type of packet losses we see on uh, cough Meraki Wi-Fi equipment. Uh, no, but on Wi-Fi and other things like that, um, that, that, uh, that the, that the visual artifacts and in perceptual experience for the end user is, is least bad. <laughs> so I hope that sort of answers it a bit. That does answer the question. However, it could be very much related to the kind of codec that you're using. For sure. So, okay. Thanks. You're right. <laughs> All right. Sue so asked real quick and then um, Mo, you're going to be up. Thanks. Um, th thanks, Kevin, for presenting. Uh, thanks, Suhas, for presenting. So I, I, I <laughs> agree with uh, Jonathan uh, that. Um, one of the, from my earlier experimentation with supporting the rush war datagrams and now the mock uh, models that we have, what at least myself and Christian and some of the people who developed prototype uh, learned is that having this flexibility at the transport level is important, especially when in some of the use cases that we are considering where, where we have a well-engineered relays and we would want a relays to be able to modify the transport mapping because you are using like a bulk, bulk uh, the GSO enabled packets and you don't want to kind of uh, have a mapping that's really small and works only for certain use cases. Having that um, uh, flexibility at the transport level is good. And at the same time, uh, more and more I talk to people, they have different requirements coming from either VR space, other space. They want to have a really not uh, or finalize anything at the application level mapping. And, and we need to keep that totally open as well. Thanks. So if I can say one last request as we wrap up uh, and thanks is just you know, there's a lot of options in the, that I put in, you know, in the draft or whatever. There's a lot of different possible combinations. If there are one or two of those that you think, yeah, I think that that one's going to be the winner, or there's one or two of them you think there's no way that could ever win, like give us that information so we can just eliminate a bunch of those out of the draft. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have uh, two more uh, presentations and a decision about interims to make, uh, or at least to start. So, uh, Mo, speedier than speedy. Good. Um, this is uh, the Web Codex uh, media format was called Low Overhead Container or LOC. Um, and it's an alternative to CMath. Uh, and it's based on Web Codex. And the, the current draft has a catalog format too, but that'll be uh, changing. By low overhead, we mean minimal uh, encapsulation. So on the wire, uh, high efficiency. And uh, for the application, low overhead when you're interfacing to um, Web Codex. So minimal. Uh, application overhead, minimal runtime. Next. Okay, so why are we doing this? Why not just use CMath? Uh, CMath has, uh, uh, is pretty chatty, a lot of bytes, uh, a lot of nested uh, uh, headers. It's well over 100 bytes uh, per frame, and it could be way, way uh, more than that in, in some configurations. Um, for audio, that's a non-starter. You already double the audio bit rate. Uh, so it's not efficient if you're only transporting audio. If audio is a minor you know, uh, drop in your bucket and you're seeing giant video streams, maybe it's still acceptable. Um, but if you're only doing audio, it's certainly not acceptable. And it's also just complex for the application to manage all of these, uh, these nestings, uh, this, you know, big, you know, Matryoshka multi-level, you know, thing. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of work for the app to, to have to parse and, and uh, decode and then build all of these, uh, these different nested boxes uh, to eventually extract frames. <clears throat> Uh, so why web codecs? Uh, because the authors are lazy. Uh, we didn't start looking at, by, by looking at web codecs. We were just going to go with the raw elementary bit stream 
of, of the codex that we cared about. And we realized Web Codex has already done this. So there's no reason to go back and redo that effort. There's no reason to have an IANA registry of all the codecs we care about and their elementary streams because Web Codex has a W3C registry of exactly that. So we're using Web Codex directly. And the side benefit of that is now if your application is a web application, it's using Web Codex, you can very easily consume the output uh, of, of Web Codex with a low overhead, uh, low application overhead and low wire overhead. Uh, so we refer to the Web Codex uh, registries, but really those registries um, are just the underlying elementary bitstream of, of the of a few popular codecs. It's not all codecs, it's not all the defined codecs in the RTP formats, but just a few of the most popular ones that are used in browsers for sure and used in most other applications. And this is not tied to web codecs, so you could use this outside of a web browser. You can use it outside of web codecs. Um, again, the reference web codecs is just for convenience and not having to re-register a lot of things. Next. Uh, there's a simple format. So inside of a mock object, you have the, the header and the payload. The mock object payload will have the lock header and payload. The payload is just literally the internal data of web codecs encoded video and audio chunks, which are just frames, the raw elementary bitstream frame of the underlying audio video codec. Uh, the loc header has metadata, things like sequence number, timestamp, and there's questions, open issues about whether or not those things should migrate up to the mock object header itself. Next slide. Uh, so some updates from uh, discussions on, on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we will be removing the catalog from the current draft. There'll be a common catalog uh, uh, format draft. Um, we'll be uh, renaming it to Web Codex, um, so not lock. And then there'll be a separate section of, of uh, the low overhead profile that combines all of these things together, that combines the catalog, common catalog format, the Web Codex uh, media format, and some application logic that you need uh, to bind all these together. Open issues remaining, Luke brought up a very good one that authors struggled with for a long time when writing this is the uh, in-band parameter sets versus out-of-band parameter sets. Uh, we still don't have a good solution for it. Um, we'll, we'll work on that offline. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's some header fields that could potentially move from the lock header up to the object header. We need to talk about whether that's a good idea. Um, Several people have commented about the timestamps, whether it should be a coordinated, you know, common timestamp format or whether it should be open to applications to do whatever they want with a blob, um, it needs to be decided. Uh, and then content protection, multiple content protection schemes, including S-Frame is still an open issue as well. That's it. Okay, uh, there are two people in queue. I'm gonna lock the queue now and then we'll go to their- Or do you wanna just, should we just skip it? Uh, Go ahead, but very quick. Thank you. Very, very, um, quick. very quick. Uh, two things. Um, first, um, oversimplification doesn't help. And uh, um, uh, the frame marking draft is an example for that. So I would suggest uh, follow application layer framing principles and don't just say it's video, but say it's H.264, it's H.265, it's whatever as a container and make those containers specific to the codecs. That's, that's number one. Um, number two, um, Number two, we say for later. Victor. Uh, uh, Victor, media container enthusiast. Uh, I want to say I very supportive of this work. One thing is uh, we need to, there are two things. One, it, like the danger with this is uh, uh, we might have to specify much more things that were currently missing. That the, like the entire reason uh, I was supportive of CMF originally is that CMF uh, lets us punt our problems to somewhere else, namely ISO. And here we're punting our problems to somewhere else. This is W3C, but we still need to be very careful that the layer, the difference between those layers is not something that become unmanageable. Okay, if you need to write that up to the list, please do. Uh, we have closed the queue on this. Uh, we, you we have... The chair said they would discuss whether this was going to be moved to the quick to the working group directory or not, uh, GitHub repo. Uh, so we will, we will take that to the list at this point. Uh, we're also going to tell Ali we don't have time for you. We're sorry. Um, we, we only have uh, five minutes, and we need to, to make a decision on whether we're going to try and do an interim. Uh, so uh, we have been talking uh, a lot today. There's clearly a lot we need to cover. Uh, Hopefully we can do a lot of that on the list, but we also wanna uh, ask people's appetite 
for doing uh, either an in-person or uh, virtual interim between now and Prague. And so the first question is in-person or interim, and then we'll try and find time. Uh, if we're doing an in-person, it would probably be uh, two days long, uh, maybe a day and a half, but definitely plan on uh, being wherever it is before it starts on day one and being gone late in the day of day two or day three. Uh, how many people, by show of hands, in this room, we will ask on the list as well, feel like they would be able to set aside that amount of time at the end of September or early October sometime? Uh, we have an offer for um, uh, Boston, but it's not set. So that, that would be the potential where, but it might still change. So please raise your hands if you think you might be able to set aside that amount of time. Okay. Please raise your hand if you believe you can only do a virtual. Boston, Boston. Boston. Boston with a B. <laughs> okay, so did you just raise your hands for the second question was you can only do a virtual or did you? Okay, so we've moved on. Please raise your hand if you think you can only do a virtual. Okay, one, two. Okay, okay so uh, I think we will, con given, given that balance, uh, we'll continue to, uh, to look to see if there is particular timing on an in-person. It would, of course, be hybrid. All in-person at this point would still have the same meet echo or similar support. Um, so we would not be leaving out um, uh, remote um, participants. And I think that's a, a kind of the way forward there. Okay. Um, There's Victor's in the queue. Are you in the queue? Victor, are you in the queue? Okay. Um, so that actually cleared up uh, a little quicker. So let me go back to the question that uh, was asked by Cullen. Uh, what we did with the warp draft is we didn't adopt it right away, but we did say it's gonna move into the common repo so that the issues list, et cetera, could be managed there. Are we ready to do that for web codex now? Does anybody object to doing that for web codex? Okay, so we'll ask the authors when they re-emit it with the new draft name. Uh, to put it into the uh, the common repo for the working group uh, so we can manage all of the common tags and, and management there, okay? Uh, Ali, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, please send uh, the uh, both the, the the information to to the list and to the, um, we'll, we'll, it will be in the proceedings and, and please make sure it gets sent to the list. Oh, and also I think you're presenting at the SF video meetup also, same information or more, no? Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you've got a uh, if you've got a, a video presentation that we can watch, that would be that would be great too. Okay. Okay. Can you can you circulate to the list where that's going to be so that people have a, uh, an awareness of it? Uh, thanks, and and my apologies again. For, just for the chairs, could you put the numbers of the people that were available in the in the minutes? Uh, okay, so the I, I saw about uh, 25, 26 people who said that they were available for in-person and only two or three who said they definitely could only do virtual. Uh, so again, that's that's not great given we have 100. Um, so we'll, it's still possible that we'll go back to virtual, but the we'll keep trying on the uh, physical interim at this at this stage. Thanks, everyone, and see you on the list. Uh, un unsurprisingly, several people who said that, who are currently virtual said they could only do virtual. So check the chat. OK, I will check the chat. And we're going to have to take it to the list, obviously, anyway. Yeah, yeah. It will go to the mailing list for final decision. I think a lot of people are undecided. And they didn't, there was no option to say, I just don't know. I can't commit to one or the other. OK, uh, and, and, and that's why. Yeah, I, my question for the repo. So we want to make a catalog talk, right? Sue has started a catalog talk. It's outside the repo. I am going to modify the work and then create a CMAP, those drafts we spoke about. Do, do we do that directly in the mock repository? Or do we do it outside and then we vote on them and we bring them in? What's the procedure? 